Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Kimi Mochizuki from uh, University of Tokyo, Earthquake Research Institute, University of Tokyo. Then I would like to talk about the, uh, the offshore cable observation systems that, that Yoshi introduced in this, in his, uh, in this previous talk. And <clears throat> uh, Yoshi introduced you uh, real uh, leading edge kind of uh, studies, researches about the, of the seismologies talking about the slow earthquakes. But I would like to um, hear, um, I would like to um, introduce you this kind of uh, in offshore cable system by look, uh, in view of um, ordinary, uh, regular kind of a seismology by looking at the uh, earthquakes occurrences. So uh, here, what is good about having offshore stations, stations meaning that the seismic stations and uh, geodesy stations, geodetic stations. And um, by having um, sensors offshore, then we can observe a smaller, smaller earthquakes in magnitude, smaller magnitude uh, earthquakes, which um, you cannot observe uh, by only the onshore stations. And uh, if we have onshore stations, and then we can uh, determine where the earthquakes occurred uh, precisely or accurately, more accurately. So that, that's this thing I will sh show you uh, some examples later. And these things, so accurate hypocenter information, and then having more information about small earthquakes occurring offshore, then these are the, the fundamental information for understanding the nature of earthquakes. Because we know where small earthquakes occur and where the earthquake exactly happened. And this is an important uh, information that contribute to understanding the earthquake generation mechanisms for uh, seismologists. And we actually do, as Yoshi introduced already, that this is another example of an ocean bottom seismometer from Japan. And this is a small one, it's a kind of ball. And um, this is, we, we, after recovery of this instrument, after a, a year-long year observation. So this uh, ball has uh, data, of seismic data, of um, duration of one year. And which means that if we fail to recover these instruments, then we lose instruments themselves, but at the same time, we lose data. So it is very important for us to recover these um, portable type of OBS, ocean bottom seismometers, we call OBS, ocean bottom seismometers, or ocean bottom pressure gauges. So we need to uh, recover them. And recently, was um, many years ago, then we had a struggle to increase the uh, percentage of recovery percentage, um, about 70%, 80%. But <laughs> recently, um, we are successful in recovering in 99, more than 99%. So we are very good at recovering them. And because it's very uh, actually expensive <laughs> too. But um, I would like to also mention, uh, as Yoshi introduced, that uh, we would like to have real time on site monitoring of uh, seismic activity and tsunamis, which is a key for, for the moment for us to uh, successfully uh, evacuate from the, from the tsunamis. So um, I would like to show you this, the um, epicenters or hypocenters, color-coded by the earthquake depth here from red to purple. And during a year of 2012, so here we have the uh, subduction system and the Pacific plate subducts here beneath this Japanese island. And uh, this is the Philippine Sea, another subduction system, which is called Nankai Trough. As Yoshi mentioned, we expect that there is going to be a big, large earthquake of magnitude 8 happening within uh, 30 years or so. So we are keen on looking at this subduction system. And we already had a very, very large one in the northeast part of Japan. And, and so uh, if you look at this seismicity here, then Many of them, so it's just covering the coastline. So I would like to uh, clearly show the, where the coastline is, and here back and forth. Then all of, many of these, majority of these earthquakes occur offshore. And <clears throat> that's the reason that we would like to do some observations offshore. 
And actually, these are the major large earthquakes in Japan. This is, uh, I plotted earthquakes with magnitudes larger than 7.4 since 1923. So majority, or most of them, occur in Osho, as you introduced. <coughs> and this is the largest one, as we recorded. This is 1999-2011 Tohokoki earthquake. So um, talking about the uh, accuracy of the earthquakes that we determined, then Japanese island, like here, here is the main, main land of Japan. And this is, the land is elongated north and south. So this is the way that probably you would uh, put sensors, seismic sensors uh, onshore of the land. It's probably you, this is the way that you put seismic stations. And because it is, so if you consider each sensor as your ear, then you have two ears. And so it is more like you're looking offshore by having ears like that, elongated in this, along this direction, or this direction, looking at facing the offshore. You have ears and you have sensors along the main line. And that means, well, because earthquakes occur in this direction, mainly offshore of this direction, so I just uh, use this uh, person here. And if earthquakes, if one earthquake occurs in the south, and then you can tell easily that it, the earthquakes occur in the south or north by measuring the difference of the time of arrivals of the energy. So it's kind of easy to distinguish if the earthquakes occur in the south, if you hear the sound from, the, from your right ear first, and then, then you hear the sound left, with the left ear, or the other way around. <clears throat> so it's quite simple, it's, it's, it's easier. But it is very difficult to distinguish earthquakes occurs how far away from you. Because we have two ears facing offshore and then it's difficult. And things make more difficult if you consider, if you take three-dimensionality into account, because earthquakes' depth are vary. So it is difficult to tell how far away, and it's more difficult to tell how deep they are. So I will go give you, and, and this is the same situation is for New Zealand too. And this is in the same scale, New Zealand and Japan. And I'll give you an example here. This is about 100 kilometers away here, just only 100 kilometers away in the sense that the, uh, the Japan Trench uh, is here, running here. So this is uh, the distribution of earthquakes that we determined by using onshore stations only. And this is the uh, earthquakes that we determined using these black diamonds of uh, ocean bottom seismometers. And Yes, um, they're different. The colors are different. Colors are coded by their depth. And purple is 50 kilometers, and red is 10 kilometers. So this is JMA hypocenters, which means that Japan Meteorological Agency determines hypocenters of these earthquakes. But generally, the distribution of earthquakes are kind of show some similarities. For example, here, there's a earthquake, kind of bunch of earthquakes occurring here and here. And there's a kind of cluster of earthquakes here and here. And then there are earthquakes surrounding some kind of an area right there. And there's a, some kind of, um, well, the aseismic region or quiet region here in the center. So something happens there. But uh, striking difference is the colors. And they think that earthquakes occur at 50 kilometers deep. And if you have ocean water seismometers there, then they actually seem to occur at the depth of 10 kilometers. So this is what the thing that I introduced. We have difficulties in determining the depth of earthquakes by looking just only that way. So if you have a station just above it, then you can easily determine the depth where they occur. So this is the reasons that um, we would like to put instruments there. Because if you slice lands like that, you cut the structure, the volume, 
and then pull it up and looking from the side. So in this sense, then this is depth, and this is the profile there. So it looks like that. So JMA hub centers distribute like this, and color coded as purple is 50 kilometers or deep, and in 10 kilometers is about reddish. But if you put offshore instruments, then they look very much different. As you see, if you have plane distribution, then they look similar. Like here, earthquakes, and the bulge of earthquakes, and the cluster of earthquakes. But actually, it looks like that if you look into the section. And you probably may write, draw a line, like curve, like this, where something happened there, because it shows kind of a curvature. But um, if, I, if you take, I just, um, in this previous section, I take 20 kilometer bound to slice the structure, the volume. But if you have only two kilometer, it's this one kilometer uh, on both sides of this, uh, this black line, black solid line here, then it looks like that, just two kilometer aside. And you know here, there is, of course, the, there is a plate subducting, the Pacific plate. But here, you can't tell it, nothing. It's very difficult. It's to, out of imagination that there is something going on. So um, this is how the uh, importance of the uh, ocean, to have ocean bottom instruments offshore to know, to understand what is going on. And this is the collaborative work, myself and then people from GNS Science and Victoria University. <clears throat> we deployed, we put four instruments during this period in the year from April to March, April 2012 to March 2013, 2013. And this is Geonet Hypocenters. And this is OBS Hypocenters. We deployed OBSs for a year and then we recovered four of them, 100% recovery rate. And then we uh, analyzed the data. And we plotted the earthquakes. Oh, by the way, I would like to mention, uh, I forgot to mention, the, of course, because we could uh, record smaller earthquakes, then the, the difference also, okay, you can see in the number of earthquakes plotted here. So JMA hypercenter is only 3,000. It's quite large. But if you look at this, OBS epicenter is more than 17,000. So it's about five times more and more. But here, so this is the reason that we recorded smaller earthquakes that uh, JMA uh, failed to observe by using the onshore stations. So now the, this region, quiet region, is more clear on this uh, right-hand panel. So here's New Zealand. And Geonet to determine hypocenters, this is 4,000 all, uh, all around. And because uh, we had a limited number of sensors, uh, stations here, then we just determined the hypocenters uh, around this region, which is 2005 earthquakes in this case. And yes, there are similarities. The earthquakes are kind of, they're terminated along the coastline like this. Here, there's a, there's a band of earthquakes along the coastline inward, landward. And yes, it is true. Well, by look, we have let's share the similarity to these two earthquakes. And but the difference is, yes, there is a um, kind of a um, elongated um, earthquakes line of earthquakes here. But if you look at the OBS, it's more like an area where earthquake is quite active. This is because that if you use these stations, then it is again difficult to tell where, how far away the earthquakes are. So it seems like there's a kind of line of earthquakes because it's difficult to also at the same time determine the depth of them. But we can specify the depth, constrain the depth of the earthquakes, and then we measure the arm, the length of this arm, then we can determine where right there the earthquakes occur. So this is where earthquakes actually is active. And also there is some kind of active region around. And again, the difference is also the colors. The colors are coded by the, uh, the depth. And this is, I'm not saying that, okay, or Geonet, they're not doing well. Well, Ge Geonet does pretty well, but they don't have an ability to determine accurately 
those hypercenters because they don't have offshore stations. Why we can do this is because we have offshore stations, just only four stations, and then the distribution of hypercenters will be dramatically improved. So um, I introduced the reasons why we do that. would like to have to improve our information, fundamental information, for understanding what is happening uh, in the subduction zone. And this is the one that we use. And I, will try to move, I would like to move on to the next topic, real-time on-site monitoring of these seismic activity. And <clears throat> because this is actually not real-time, the sensor, we have to put the instruments there for a year long and then we have to recover them. So here's an, an introduction of what the cable system is, and it looks like, as you, you would imagine, that, that there are cable, and there's one nose of um, sensors, the typical sensors or seismometers for, observing, for observation of earthquakes and pressure gauges for observation of tsunamis. The, the cables are different uh, depending on the depth, and it beca becomes thinner as you go farther, uh, because there is tension, much tension here. And usually we um, bury the cable because of some fisheries going on uh, in the coastline, near the coastline. So bury the cable here, and then the uh, cables are stretched out offshore. And there's a land station, landing station, which uh, receive the data from the cable and transmit the data to the uh, universities or uh, the net seismic networks. And this is the distribution of the cable system around Japan, already we have. And the green one is a, the newest one, which is installed. But uh, it's now still uh, doing something on this, and then we will uh, hopefully uh, get data uh, distributed uh, soon. But uh, still, they, they're already there. And from the black, blue one, we started to deploy these systems since 1980. And this is a first generation system which is utilizing the telecommunication system. So this, we cut the telecommunication tele, uh, cable and then put instruments in between them. And so it's a wired uh, system. And then it's about 10 years later, 1980 or 20 years later, then we started to have second generation system here, the red ones. So Blue One's first generation started to have this because we're keen on looking at the Nankai trough subduction system where we expected, we expect that, that there's going to be another earthquake, large earthquake there, and then near the metropolitan center of, the, of Japan. And then second generation system started somewhere in 2000, which we have an optical fiber cable system. So uh, here, and then the, the Transmission of data transfer is higher uh, with optical cable. So we can attach more sensors on these cable system. Then, this is actually after the Tohoku earthquake 2011, the government decided that we will have this large cable system covering entire the Japan Trench region. Uh, this is already installed again, uh, as I said again, as I said before. And also we have a um, very dense network, DUNET, network, uh, which started to occur in operation in 2011. It's about the same time that um, synchronized with the, uh, somehow, the Tohoku earthquake. So we have data already collecting from this uh, cable system. And we also plan to in deploy the uh, cable system here. We're now discussing how uh, we de deploy this cable system. So we now have 200 stations, and this is the first generation and this is a scale of 50 centimeters. And actually, the third generation cable system it is 50 centimeters. So if you put this instrument there, then it's just the size of where, or here. So it is about one fourth or so of the, of the volume. So because uh, of this technology improvement, then we have a smaller uh, node for the third generation system. And third generation system is internet. Actually, so each sensor has an um, internet connection. So that, and which makes the uh, reliability of the data. So, so this is an example that we had. Because we de already deployed uh, these sensors at the time that Tohoku earthquake, then we do have the data 
uh, from these tsunami sensors, as you see introduced. And we have the cable system here, and OBS meaning that seismological, seismology, uh, seismic sensors. And then TM1, TM2 are very important. They are tsunami sensors. And this is the distribution as Yoshi introduced. So we had a very, very large slip at the toe of the subduction, uh, the plate interface, I mean, along the trench, which we didn't expect that could happen. So this is a quite new view of the plate interface, the characteristics of the plate interface. Before this talk of the earthquake, as Yoshi introduced, then we never expected the, the toe of this here never slipped as the amount of 50 meters or the uplift of five meters, because it slipped 50 meters, and then there's an uplift of five meters, and that caused the tsunami. And this, and Yoshi's data of ocean bottom pressure gauges, and as well as this tsunami, is a, the quite an, contribute to, well, this is, provides an evidence that this exactly happened. Without these kind of data sets, scientists would never still, I think, believe that there is actually a 50 meter slip because it was difficult to imagine that. And this is the very data that proved that 50 meter slip occurred at the toll. And then this is 2011 March earthquake at 1446 occurred. And then these tsunami sensors, because the uh, ground shaking, the tsunami sensors also picked up some vibration of the earthquake itself, ground, ground motion. And then it feels the tsunami height coming in at the TM1 first, and then TM2. The tsunami height become a little, became a little bit larger than that. So it means that because it has the height is five meters, it doesn't mean that it, it is five meter tsunami comes all over to the landward. As it goes closer to the land, then it, this becomes higher and higher. So that's why that we have 10 meter height or uh, even a four kilometer inundation of the, due to this tsunami. And then somehow, so this is about five, five, five minutes between this TM1 and TM2. And then 10 minutes later, then data was lost because the tsunami, this land station was washed away because of tsunami. So we just lost the data coming in, which means that we observed this large high tsunami, but we have 10 minutes or so after this observation that large tsunami is coming, actually coming toward us. So um, because we have cable system, then we, can, we may be able to do this. And this is the um, simulation how we can tell the arrival, this, in this case, this is um, the earthquake uh, ground shaking data. So on the left, it is about 18 seconds that ground sh shaking, that we feel ground shaking. 18 seconds after the uh, onset of the earthquake. But here, we have, suppose that we have cable system Of course, we, we know right away. Oops. We know right away where the epicenter is. Again, um, if you don't have offshore station, then it is dif to tell, it's difficult to tell the way, how far away. And, but here, then you can pinpoint the place where earthquake occurred. And the next simulation is this. On the right-hand side, this is a simulation of Tohokoki earthquake tsunami. And then tsunami occurred, and this large tsunami touched uh, the coastline after 20, 26 minutes or so. So we have 20 minutes. But if we have tsunami sensors here, It's there, right there. So uh, about, well, instantly we, t we can tell what kind of tsunami is coming in toward us. So um, in conclusion, this is a conclusion, 
concluding remarks, then what is good about having offshore stations? Yes, we can collect more information about it precisely and accurately about what is going on in terms of seismicity offshore by, by looking at these data sets from the offshore cable system as we have here, a bunch of cable systems installed already. And so better understanding of this generation mechanism, this, this contributes to understanding how and where the earthquakes occur is generated. And then that would give you an idea that contribute to better estimation of ground shaking because we know that how and what kind of what types of earthquakes or how large it can be. And then in addition to this, then if you have real-time on-site monitoring, then this is this makes possible the early warning system to save people's lives because we have again uh, I showed you an example that we already recorded the tsunami of five meter high ten minutes before the tsunami really arrived the coastline as and so um, it is important to have cable system so thank you very much for your attention.